So everyone, please help me welcome Thierry. Thierry got his PhD from the University of Washington, where he was one of the first contributors to TVM, and now a widely used open source deep learning compiler. Uh, his research aimed to facilitate hardware software co-design with a complete open source deep learning stack. So that's TVM plus VTA, so that's the FPGA plugin. Today, Thierry spends his time growing a 2.5 year old Seattle-based startup called OctoML. Uh, so he's the VP of technology partnerships and a co-founder there, uh, where he's building a unified machine learning optimization and deployment platform. So, uh, so yeah. welcome to Ari. Please go ahead. Oh. Sorry, I muted myself. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, very excited to be here. So let's jump right in. I'm going to go ahead and share the slide deck. And uh, time budget wise, when should I stop? Um, so we have just under an hour. Uh, just under an hour, okay. And uh, in terms of q and I'm happy to be interrupted at any time. So please free to ask your questions along the way. Uh, but if no questions pop up, I'll, I'll make sure to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So, um, all right, well, thank you. And uh, it's a great pleasure, yeah, as, I, as I said, to uh, be giving this, uh, this lecture here today. And uh, as part of the topics of the day, all I talk about is TVM, TVM, TVM. Uh, why should anyone use TVM? You know, what is this uh, framework really about? How does it work underneath the hood? You know, what is the, the secret sauce that makes it work so well across a wide collection of models and hardware targets? And what are the exciting applications of TVM that you can get it, uh, today, you know, if you were to try it out, and especially given that this is, um, this lecture is in the context of, of a class. Uh, think about the kind of projects that you could do with TVM, deploying it ML on a lot of interesting kinds of devices. So I'll just motivate uh, quickly by mentioning that AI is now pervasive. AI inference is pervasive on a lot of edge systems, uh, your smartwatch, your, uh, your smart speaker, uh, perhaps your uh, your security uh, camera at the uh, entrance of your building will all use AI to some extent to do speech processing, to do some form of NLP. And sometimes this has to be done on the edge under extreme constraints uh, due to the limitations of the hardware that are present on the edge. And sometimes it's offloaded onto the cloud. So you end up having to serve AI either on, on really small energy constrained devices or in the cloud within a setting where you're really trying to maximize the, the, the efficiency per watt or the efficiency per dollar of all of these AI inference tasks. And I assume that by now you've been to several lectures and you have a lot of familiarity with inference versus training. And really this talk will focus on inference. And so when we're talking about AI inference, uh, we're faced uh, as ML engineers with this uh, deployment challenge where first of all, you're working with a trained model and it might be coming from different frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. It might be serialized in different ways. It might use this Onyx formats. And now you're faced with this challenge of deciding what kind of system you're gonna deploy your ML on. Uh, is it a server processor or GPU? Are we talking about running on mobile, on an IoT device? What kind of ISA are you using? Is it RISC-5? Is it ARC? Is it uh, ARM? And you might also, have, have dealt or, or have read about a lot of the exciting work being done in the space of designing specialized hardware. And so as you try to navigate all these options, right, this essentially creates a matrix of, of deployment options where you have to decide, well, where am I taking my model from? Where has it been trained? And where can it run on? And so let's say you're trying to deploy on a small ARM microcontroller if your model has been trained inside of TensorFlow, you can use TensorFlow Lite Micro, and there's a good infrastructure to get your models deployed there. But perhaps the story might not be the same if you're using PyTorch or if you're using another, um, you know, if you're using Onyx, for instance. So as a ML engineer, you're faced with this growing challenge and these growing pains of having to use a lot of different tooling based on what kind of deployment you're looking into. And a lot of these tools are built on different kinds of libraries and runtimes. And so the complexity is very high. And so to summarize the challenge, you have countless models out there. There's a lot of model zoos, repositories, new architectures are being uh, proposed and presented every day. And the number of 
hardware targets and, and, and platforms is growing every day as well. And we've seen there's a lot of companies that are also dedicating a lot of effort towards designing new exciting chips. So one conventional approach to solve this problem has been to use hand-tuned, highly optimized libraries. And oftentimes these are provided by hardware vendors. Um, I've provided several examples that were designed and optimized by different companies like AMD, NVIDIA, or Intel that essentially build a custom library that can map certain kinds of neural network or deep learning operations onto uh, your hardware very efficiently. And generally, the design of these libraries are informed by a wide range of ML, um, or very popular ML computations. Uh, but unfortunately, these are uh, difficult to, to scale uh, and adapt to new workloads. So uh, on top of this, they're extremely labor intensive uh, due to the fact that they have to be written and engineered by a highly skilled uh, group of uh, engineers that understand how the hardware work very well and are able to sometimes write these kinds of machine learning kernels that, that have to be extremely efficient and that have to align uh, custom assembly code that is specifically tailored for the hardware target. So as you are introduced with new model architectures or as your hardware capabilities evolve over time, right? you're introducing new generations of chips every year, you need to adapt the software stack to those new constraints. And this takes a great deal of effort. Uh, I've worked with a lot of companies that often face the same problem. Uh, and as you know, ML is a field that evolves very quickly. So these libraries are, are, are uh, essentially generic and they might not necessarily be tuned for a particular model or use case. Uh, and oftentimes hardware vendors will inform the design of these libraries based on a popular set of workloads based on customer workloads, but it's hard to predict the next step. Uh, what will future workloads look like? Uh, what is the next trend in ML uh, that will emerge? And how can I get my libraries to be optimized for that future use case? It's very hard to anticipate. So to recap, the challenge is that we'd like to be able to automatically generate the fastest implementations and I really want to emphasize them automatically here, right? How can we remove the human out of the loop to provide a solution for these countless models out there, right? That are specified and trained by different frameworks and different formats and run them on this explosion, uh, this uh, Cambrian explosion of new hardware devices, right? Which is, which is a really great opportunity for folks who are working on compilers, you know, to seize because it's, it's really a unique set of conditions that that dictate innovation in our field. So with that, I'd like to introduce TVM, uh, which is this open source optimization framework for machine learning that provides a solution to this problem that I just mentioned. It can ingest models from varied sources, including PyTorch, TensorFlow, Onyx, MXNet, et cetera. And it can target a wide array of hardware backends. Uh, and I will talk about what makes it special, what gives it an ability to target all of these different devices that we have x86 server and edge GPUs, ARM, CPUs and microcontrollers. We have NVIDIA GPUs, uh, AMD GPUs, different kinds of ISAs are supported. And also we have accelerator support, which I'm excited to, to touch on very briefly in this talk. And within different software environments, and that's also important, right? There's the operating system that has an impact, or you might not even have an operating system and have a real-time operating system or a complete bare metal uh, microcontroller system. So all of these enforce different kinds of constraints for your machine learning deployment. And TVM here provides a solution. So I'd like to mention that TVM is actually under Apache governance. It's an open source project that I was started uh, some years ago uh, all the way back in uh, 2017. And I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the first uh, contributors and collaborators on this project. And it's grown a lot since, since then. Uh, we graduated into a full Apache project in late 2020. Uh, and actually the, the number here, it's not 430, but we're over 650 contributors now. Uh, this, uh, some of these slides might be slightly out of date, uh, but we are community owned. Uh, so it means not a single company owns TVM. Uh, it follows Apache governance rules. So we have shared ownership among different companies. And we have a very active discuss forum. Uh, and also I'd like to mention that uh, we have regular meetups and conferences 
And every year in December, although this year that might change a little bit, we have TVM Con, and there's a lot of material I'm happy to point people to, and a lot of great talks, some given by industry, some given by academia, on the kind of on all the great things that you can do with TVM today. And so I'll try to motivate TVM on top of the quick introduction I gave, based on three different use cases that I'd like to to uh, make a point on. The first one is portability. The second one is efficiency. And the last one is providing software support for new hardware devices. So on portability, I wanted to use the example of a colleague who was a UW researcher, but is today my colleague at, uh, at uh, OctaML. Uh, essentially, he was working on this interesting keyword spotting uh, model architecture that he wanted to deploy on this Azure Sphere device, which is Microsoft Secure Edge IoT device. And at the time that he was looking into this problem, there was nothing that really allowed him to deploy the model on this uh, kind of uh, hardware system. And on top of this, to add to the difficulty, uh, this Azure Sphere is essentially a, you know, a microcontroller style device with very limited SRAM and very bare bones RTOS and unique challenges like no C++ support, no dynamic linking. So it essentially eliminated a lot of options for deploying ML on these devices. And a lot of designers here have to deal with essentially building this model from scratch on a device like this, which is very tedious. So for this ML engineer, they're very happy with what TensorFlow or PyTorch offer. But when they have to take a model and deploy on a device that these frameworks do not support, you're faced with a huge challenge, right? And so TVM provides this ability to deploy ML on a lot of exotic platforms where deployment would be, if it had to be manual, would be painstakingly difficult otherwise. Another example is TVM for efficiency. So I'm gonna use the example of this uh, Facebook uh, AI systems engineer, Andrew Tullock, who gave a talk at, at TVM conference a couple of years ago. And they're serving this model in the cloud, this wave RNN model. And the default option here was to use PyTorch because PyTorch works on x86, right? It's, it's, uh, the, the challenge that you're facing here is, is not that you cannot run the model on the hardware, you can already run it, but it's unfortunately too slow. And some of the real time constraints, which was 24 kilohertz sampling, uh, essentially doing real time uh, analysis of, of uh, audio uh, requires a 40 microsecond inference net runtime. But unfortunately, the PyTorch model ran orders of magnitude above. So this engineer used TVM as a playground uh, for applying all sorts of optimizations, which I've listed here. So they started with PyTorch, they imported to TVM, then they applied sparse optimization, block sparse optimizations, right? That's a recognition that there's a lot of uh, zero valued weights that you can prune out. And then they applied some uh, data type optimizations like uh, using uh, special data types uh, that lead to higher throughputs on the hardware target and then applied another layer of uh, polynomial approximations to some of the operators. And at the end, they were able to essentially meet the real-time constraint and get uh, the overall model to get sped up by about 100x in a week. Uh, so this is a very talented engineer, a systems engineer that is able to take a model that runs in the cloud. It's already supported by PyTorch, but you need to go an extra step further in terms of meet the deployment constraints. And so in this case of the engineer, uh, really, you know, the, the key here is to achieve and unlock as much efficiency as possible out of your hardware. And so TVM, on top of giving you that broad uh, ability to target different hardware, it also provides you with a lot of automated optimizations, which I will touch on, that allow you to get the most efficiency out of your target hardware, right? Once you've trained your model, you're ready for deployment, how can you get the best throughput on that hardware target? And oftentimes this makes a difference between a model that goes into production and one that doesn't, right? As, uh, as we are probably very well aware. And so the third motivation here is TVM for software support. And um, <laughs> for instance, uh, Mohammed and I, we both have hardware backgrounds. So we've worked on uh, hardware acceleration in the past, right? And that might involve FPGAs or ASICs. And I'm sure some of you uh, have uh, some hardware or electrical engineering background. 
there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to build chips and specialized hardware for AI. You know, this is the, the next wave of deep learning revolution. Uh, and we're seeing software companies, we're seeing uh, IC vendors, you know, startups all over the world, IP companies design hardware accelerators. And so for a lot of these companies, the challenge is now that I have my hardware, you know, I've, I've taped it out, I'm ready to build a software stack. And man, this is really hard. <laughs> and a lot of, a, a lot of uh, hardware companies building their own accelerator realize how challenging it is because they're trying to, you know, plug your hardware accelerator into a whole ecosystem of software stacks. You're not trying to build a single one. You're essentially trying to, to, to take advantage of interoperability uh, that is exposed by different software stacks. So what are solutions that you can use here to really lower the barrier of entry to allow programmers to access your hardware? And, you know, what do you invest in? What technology do you invest in? Do you go all in on TensorFlow, all in on PyTorch, or all in on Onyx Runtime? Or could you find a solution that checks all the above boxes, right? So I've talked to essentially about three different kinds of personas, right? Uh, the ML engineer, the systems engineer, the hardware engineer, for which TVM solves real pains. And just to convince you that TVM has been solving these pains, I have some examples of TVM's impact on industry. As I said, we had this TVM conference with over 700 attendees last year. And TVM has been shown to really allow for model deployments, uh, facilitate model deployments on the edge or in the cloud with these examples where, you know, uh, Facebook was able to optimize models. Uh, AWS was able to use TVM to optimize uh, Alexa Wake Up, uh, um, to power uh, Alexa Wake Up uh, across a lot of devices. And also we have examples of uh, hardware manufacturers like Qualcomm and Arm relying heavily on TVM to access the multitude of hardware IPs, you know, CPUs, GPUs, and accelerators, uh, on their SFCs. So a lot of really great motivating examples to use TVM today. And so my talk will touch on, on several points. Uh, the first one, you know, really what I want to get, at, what I want everyone to get out of today's class is, all right, what can you use TVM for? But also how does TVM work, right? I've motivated it. I've told you it's very broad. It's very applicable to a lot of hardware de devices. It can provide a lot of optimization potential. But what lies under the hood that enables all of this uh, goodness, right, out of a TDM stack? And so uh, I'll touch on four different points. I'll start with operator level optimizations. Then I'll switch gears and talk about how TVM automates the optimization process. I'll also talk about graph level optimizations, right? So I'm going to talk about optimizations at two different levels of abstraction in your workload. And finally, I'm going to talk about microcontroller support and touch a little bit on, on hardware accelerator support. So talk about uh, talking about exotic uh, device support uh, that TVM enables, uh, which is, I think, something that's really exciting. So just to dive into what makes TVM special, I'm going to use a very simple uh, top-down overview of how inference works. And I'm going to use the simple example here of a simple classifier or essentially you have a neural network. Uh, we often represent them as nodes that are you know, interconnected. And in comes an input, for instance, an image here, right? This is a vision workload. This was probably a convolutional neural network. You want to classify this image as a cat. So in comes an image, out comes a classification. So what's inside? And I assume that at this point, you're already fairly familiar, but it helps to just recap what lies in, uh, within that model. So typically we represent models as, as, a, as, a, as a compute graph, right? Each node essentially is this, what we refer to as a layer. Uh, in uh, machine learning compilers line, we like to use the term operator, right? So 2D convolution, in comes data, like your input tensor, these are your activations, right? They change every time you look at new data. And then you have your parameter tensor or your weights. Uh, these remain uh, consistent across all inputs that you feed through because they were obtained by essentially doing training or backpropagation on a labeled data set. And out comes your output tensor, right? 
And so essentially, if you think of a compute graph or a neural network, it's not so different from, say, a DAG that you see in a, in a, a say, in a compiler where operators are, are you know, additions and multiplications, uh, you know, simple scalar operations, whereas in, in deep learning compilers, an operator can be uh, thousands, if not millions or billions of scalar operations, right? In this Comp2D, taking two very large input and parameter tensors and applying 2D convolution. So this is a way to, to, to have a global view on your model uh, and, and represent the massive amounts of computations that are performed underneath the hood in a simple visual representation. And so we're going to dive into what constitutes each operator, right? Each layer, like this comp 2 d and how one can make it run really fast with target hardware. Because that's really what this compiler tries to achieve is what is the best implementation that I can get for this layer, right? That constitutes this model on this given hardware. And every hardware differs. So I'm going to use a very simple, uh, naive approach to writing uh, matrix multiplication, just to keep the example fairly simple, right? Uh, matrix multiplication is used in transformers or fully connected layers inside of uh, vision workloads. And so you essentially take uh, two matrices, you multiply them with one another, and now it becomes a result matrix. If you were to implement uh, the program on the left, right, which is how we all learn how to write matrix multiplication in some of our first programming classes, you'd get a correct implementation. It would run correctly. It would put, output the right results, but it might actually be slow. And in fact, it might be very slow on your hardware, even when you're programming the, the, the laptop that you use every day. In fact, when people want to optimize matrix multiplication on a given hardware target, uh, they will write code that looks like this, where you have assembly in line. You might explicitly do prefetch operations. Um, the code will, instead of looking like this nice compact uh, nested loop, you'll have thousands of lines of code. So why would people write code like this uh, that's completely unreadable and hard to maintain? Well, the key here is, is that the code on the right is a whole lot faster and sometimes orders of magnitude faster than the code on the left. If you don't believe me, you can look at real life examples uh, by looking inside of uh, open source repositories. Uh, for instance, if you dig into uh, TensorFlow, we can look at how uh, different operators are implemented. So in this case, uh, you can look at depthwise convolution, apply to unsigned integers uh, of eight bits for a three by three filter. And this file will have 13 lines of code. And this is carefully and expert, expertly crafted code. And the reason why there are so many lines of code is because, once again, you're using a lot of in, uh, assembly and inlining. Uh, there's a lot of different implementations for different quantization types as well, uh, different access strides and rounding modes. And you might also want to include, depending on your hardware capability, right? You might be dealing with different kinds of chips, uh, different kinds of, in this case, it's for ARM chips. Uh, you might want to take advantage of, of vector intrinsics if they're available. So this results in code that is very complex, very large, hard to maintain, but works really fast. And so there's a trade-off here, which is you either have compact code that is highly readable and easy to maintain, or you have expertly crafted code that runs really fast, but it's huge, it's bloated, you have to update it, it's expensive. And given the fact that there's a lot of operators and that list grows almost every day because people discover new ways of expressing ML workloads, you have to deal with different input tensor shapes, you have to deal with different kinds of parameters to those operators like dilation, strides, batting sizes, for convolutions. And also your hardware will change, right? There will be new architectures being introduced of CPUs that might introduce new assembly um, capabilities to accelerate ML. Uh, you might be exposed to uh, different CPUs or GPUs that have different cache hierarchies, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, essentially the challenge is huge here to just have this, this ability to take these layers and run them fast on your hardware. So TVM builds on top of this notion of separation between 
functional definition and schedule definition. And this was an innovation that was introduced by the Halite programming model uh, aimed for uh, vision applications. And essentially the idea is that you provide a separation between these two concepts. The functional definition essentially just defines what the function should do. So this is almost similar to writing a mathematical equation, right? Uh, you're essentially saying that uh, a convolution or Gaussian blur is essentially the result of applying this mathematical uh, formula on neighboring pixels, right, uh, of the input image and out comes the output image. Uh, but you're not really implying any information on the way that the input data is stored in memory or the way that input data should be accessed, right? There's no implicit assumption on ordering uh, that you are making when you describe the algorithm. The way you can actually concretize that information is by providing a schedule definition, right? And the schedule specifies how the function is implemented. And when we write a matrix multiplication in an imperative language, we essentially define those two concepts into one, right? Which was the, the um, matrix multiply example I showed earlier. And so with this approach, uh, of functional definition and schedule definition separation, TVM introduced this tensor expression language that essentially let you get the best of both worlds. So let me explain to you through an example how with a very minimal amount of lines of code and code that is fairly understandable and readable, one can achieve the levels of performance of the handwritten kernel that has thousands of lines of code. So in this tensor expression DSL example, you essentially have a definition of your algorithm and a definition of your schedule. And here we have a, just a one line definition of a schedule, which is your vanilla schedule. So you have your algorithm here, which is, you know, you have two matrices, you define a reduction axis, and then you define the computation, which is the matrix multiplication, which essentially, you know, defines how to compute each output of your output uh, matrix uh, based on you know, element-wise multiplication and a reduction along the reduction axis. And once you compile this program, you get this tensor level IR or TIR program, which is an internal representation in TVN, uh, which essentially defines the low level implementation. So this language is a language that is specific and internal to the compiler. But essentially, it materializes how this matrix multiplication gets implemented at the end of the day. And because we are using a default schedule, this looks a lot like the matrix multiplication example that I showed you written in this imperative program, right? Which is a nested loop and essentially that, that traverses the different dimensions of your input matrices and performs a reduction on those element wise multiplications. And so, this is how you would write a program. This is the naive implementation. There's a there's actually an ordering of how you access memory that is applied. And the performance of this would probably be pretty poor. So how would you make this program run faster? Well, you start to work on the schedule and you try to optimize the schedule. So one simple optimization that you can apply to the schedule with these extra lines of code is to apply blocking or some other people would also refer to this as loop tiling. So essentially you're, 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 you're computing your output matrix in chunks, right? And the goal here for anyone who's, who's tried to accelerate programs on, on CPUs or GPUs is that essentially you wanna define a work size for this matrix multiplication that fits well within your caches of your processor or your GPU. That way you get really good memory reuse, all right? So we're gonna apply this loop tiling with these few lines of code. And now you're gonna end up with a program that gets generated once you compile it, that has six levels of nested loops, right? So now you have a bit more of a complex, slightly more complex implementation of this matrix multiplication. It's still doing the same thing, right? Nothing has changed in terms of what you're producing, but what has changed is the way you access the, the data and the way you assume that it's been stored in memory to get as much reuse as possible of data in your cache, for instance. You can also take advantage of hardware functionality, for instance, vectorization if it's available. This applies essentially it takes advantage of vector instructions on your GPU or your CPU. And there's a lot of other, you know, 
optimizations that I don't want to spend too much time on, but that we applied here in this short uh, schedule implementation. And the takeaway I wanted to show here is that by adding these handful of lines of code, we're talking maybe a dozen lines of code, you produce a program that has essentially that is much more difficult to parse, right? Uh, much more complex in terms of uh, the way it accesses data than your original naive implementation, which is equivalent to our simple matrix multiplication. But essentially we were able to keep the original specification of the schedule, very simple, uh, easy to maintain and, and read through, and essentially produce a program that is about 200 times faster than the original program with a few lines of code. So here we, we're, we're kind of getting the best of both worlds in the sense that we're still having a compact specification of how we're going to implement matrix multiplication on the target hardware while also getting the performance that you would get with a really big program that has, you know, probably in the order of a hundred lines of code, right? And we've applied all these optimizations, like tiling, changing the loop permutations, applying a rate packing, you can apply vectorization, thread level parallelization, et cetera, to use all the available cores. And that with just, you know, a handful of lines of code, which is really neat. So I'm going to switch gears and so far I've showed you how one can manually tune a schedule to get really good performance, but perhaps we can leave it to automation and why not use ML for ML, which is the next chapter I'm going to talk about here very briefly. And in the prior example, just with these few lines of, of code, we could accelerate the original program by about 200 X, right? And this is measured on an X86 CPU. So because it's on x86, we're going to compare it to a really good hand-tuned library called MKL, which, uh, which is very popular on Intel, uh, on Intel CPUs and powers a lot of the, the you know, runtimes and, and frameworks uh, that, that, are, uh, that people use in machine learning. So by comparing what we did in the last few slides with the performance of MKL, we're still below that uh, hand-tuned performance. We're about 60%, which is pretty good. You know, now we're within, within striking distance. What can we do more to get to that level of performance? And, and one way to get this level of performance is, well, you sit down in a room and you try a lot of different schedule implementations and permutations and loop tiling strategies and, you know, you stay in that room until you get to 100%. Uh, that could take you a while, unless you're really good at what you do. You know the hardware architecture very well. You've written high performance uh, programs before, and you kind of know how you need to get to this uh, state of, of performance to beat MKL. But perhaps another solution is to leave it to automation, leave it to machine learning to explore. Uh, and in fact, on some operators, you often end up with a schedule space, right? This is the space of all possible schedule implementations for the same program, right? But they're all different because you're using different ways of accessing memory, reusing memory, applying vectorization, parallelization, et cetera. And that space can be as big as, you know, billions of possible uh, schedules for operators. So if you're bad at this and you're sitting in the room, you're not gonna get out for a while, right? <laughs> this, is, this might take some time. So there was this work called AutoTVM that was, uh, introduced at NeurIPS in 2018, that essentially ap applies automation to the problem. And so you start with an expression, uh, which is a schedule template that defines the search space, right? The search space has billions of different con configurations. And you use auto TVM, uh, which essentially takes this expression and tries to fill in the holes that have been left open, right? It's a schedule template. So you're leaving the permutations open for exploration. You're leaving the depth of the tiling open for exploration, whether you apply vectorization or parallelization along which axis, you lift all of those parameters out of your template for auto TVM to explore automatically. And so auto TVM will essentially fill in the holes, which is C, this optimization configuration. And you're gonna generate real code that can run on hardware. This code generates a program, you run that on the hardware, you measure the execution cost. And now you essentially have a problem where your objective uh, function is to uh, find uh, essentially this uh, 
uh, this optimization configuration that would minimize the overall execution cost on your hardware. And so uh, the, the uh, approach that I described here can be sold with uh, essentially uh, machine learning for optimizing machine learning, where essentially you, you build a statistical cost model of how your, how your uh, program uh, runs on, on your target hardware informed by a lot of training data from doing trial and error on your hardware. And so this, this uh, work is described in the paper that I attach here. Uh, and the benefit here is that you can automatically adapt to different hardware types using the statistical cost model approach, uh, meaning that you don't have to look at the specs of your CPU. You know, how many different levels of cache does it have? Do you have an L3 or do you just have an L2? Uh, what are the sizes? How many cores do you have? Uh, what's the vectorization? Uh, with uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are questions that are essentially automatically uh, explored using this uh, black box approach, uh, black box assumption that your hardware um, characteristics are not known ahead of time and that you're essentially learning those through this uh, automated exploration process. And this lets you essentially explore a really large solution space all the while you know, informed by the statistical model, applying the right changes to the schedules to get to a very good solution. And in this paper, for instance, we show that uh, auto TVM approach on operators could beat the vendor specific baseline on the hardware target uh, that we were testing. And in this case, we we're looking at an NVIDIA GPU. So here, the, the king of the hill that we wanted to beat was QDNN. And uh, when we ran this study, we essentially uh, aimed to get past this, uh, this uh, dotted line here. And as you can see, we're 50% faster than this uh, hand-tuned hand uh, library implementation by the hardware vendor. And of course, you know, at any point in time, these can change because these libraries are constantly updated. But at least at the time, it was, it was pretty groundbreaking that we could get so much efficiency out of, uh, out of a single operator. And then once you apply that to all the layers, you get really good speed ups. So, so far I've talked about optimization at a single layer uh, level. So uh, what about combining this with graph level optimizations, right? So we've talked about the operator, right? This is your layer or it can be a, a series of fused layers. And can you combine this with other optimizations that you apply at the graph level? So I'm gonna talk about essentially popping a level up back to the whole network um, and what kind of optimization you can apply holistically there. Now that you have this ability, this really nice ability to generate custom code for your hardware target. So TBM uses Relay. Uh, which is another uh, intermediate representation inside of the TVM stack. So far, I've talked about Tensor Expression DSL. I've talked about Tensor IR. And really is a high-level IR, which is a functional and static, statically typed IR to describe ML computation, right? And so you can actually use it as a, as a programming language to describe ML computation. And there's a lot of flexibility baked into Relay uh, to express all sorts of interesting workloads. Uh, it implements common features in ML frameworks like quantization, shape inference as standard optimization passes. So anyone who's worked on GCC or LLVM might be familiar with the notion of compiler passes, right? It takes an intermediate representation, massages it, applies changes, and produces an output intermediate representation. They're functionally equivalent, but the output runs better than the input because you've applied some compiler optimizations. And the idea here is to do the same with machine learning, right? You look at machine learning as a program and you apply those compiler optimizations to that program. And so um, actually in this talk, we're just gonna look at operator fusion. Uh, I, I will add the quantization examples in the final slides I'll share after this class, but. Uh, for, for, for time's sake, we're going to look at how operator fusion is applied uh, in TVM, thanks to Relay. And so one way that Relay looks at your program is that you have these different operators like a Conf2D and Bashcom and Relu. And in, in, in the intermediate uh, activations, you have all of these tensors that essentially uh, store uh, these uh, intermediate values 
as you're, as you're processing information throughout the compute graph. But unfortunately, this approach to implementing or evaluating one layer at a time is fairly inefficient. And if you're looking at uh, optimizing the performance of your program as much as possible, you realize that you're introducing a lot of DRM access bottlenecks in between those operators. And this is really taxing in terms of performance. So one approach to making this simple program run faster is to apply operator fusion. So when applicable, and there's rules to operate fusion, you can take a conf2d node and essentially fuse it with batch normalization and ReLU so that you don't have to do as much data movement as you're performing this computation. You don't have to have so many intermediate tensor uh, that you have to move from, from say, uh, your, your uh, DRAM. Uh, in, in the case of, 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 a, of a GPU, you'd have to move it between your main memory and through PCI Express to your GPU memory. Um, uh, sorry, no, actually, in, in this example, uh, I'd like to correct myself. You'd be moving the, the data from GPU memory to uh, your, your uh, shared memory or, or caches. So, so that itself is expensive as you have to load uh, data from DRAM to SRAM. And so uh, the, the key here is to apply fusion of these operators and compute the output tensor all at once through this fused implementation of those layers. And um, if you had to rely on the standard operator library, right, which is our baseline, you have to manually specify all the different permutations or combinations of your Conf2D with those different operators like Bash Norm and Relo that you could fuse with Conf2D. And in terms of code bloat, that results in a lot of permutations that you have to account for. So because TVM is a code generator, right, you don't have to maintain a library where you maintain our templates and they can be combined to produce code that can essentially represent all these permutations that I've mentioned. And so the beauty of relying on TVM as a code generator is that now you can specify arbitrary combinations and get valid code as a result that you can also audit to. So truly, I think where TVM Shine is in its ability to combine graph level and operator optimizations. And that minimizes DRAM access that you have to perform across the execution of the simple graph. And in this case, you can actually get fairly sizable performance improvements. And in the paper we show, this is a, this a really a tech report that you can, you can find uh, online. Uh, we show that we could uh, essentially take uh, the baseline, which is no optimizations applied and apply all of these different passes to your program as if you know you were applying uh, L2, L3 uh, levels of optimization, sorry, um, O4, O2, O3 O levels of optimizations in, in GCC or in LLVM to get faster and faster programs as you apply more optimization passes. And so here we're able to get really substantial speed ups on some of the workloads thanks to these graph level optimizations, you know, going from baseline performance to about 2X on mobile net, uh, which is quite substantial when you think that all we're doing here is just fusion and nothing else, right? We're not applying additional optimizations to, to, um, uh, to optimize the operators themselves. So to summarize this deep dive in TDM, I wanted to show you uh, essentially the full diagram of what we went through. Uh, at first, we talked about how you can take models uh, essentially from all these different frameworks. And the way you can do this is thanks to this Relay IR that essentially provides a common abstraction to import all these models from those different frameworks and representations into a common language that you can apply graph level optimizations on like uh, operator fusion. And then diving into the layers that compose this Relay IR, we talked about each layer being an operator. These operators can be expressed in this tensor expression DSL that lets you separate the schedule from the algorithm definition. And thanks to that separation, you can explore the space of all those different schedule implementations 
which essentially translates into better performance, the better schedule, the better performance in your target hardware. But we, we saw that the search space can be very big. So by applying automation to the exploration of that schedule and by informing it with a statistical cost model, you can converge to a good schedule within not too many trials and errors on the target hardware that you're measuring performance on and ultimately beating the performance of hand-tuned libraries that are vendor specific, uh, that require a lot of effort to maintain and, uh, and actually in some cases beat their performance. And to convince you, I will show you these uh, results that were the subject of a uh, recent blog post on OctaML website, which shows uh, performance comparison between TVM, TensorFlow Lite and Onyx Runtime on Cortex A72 which is uh, the processor that you find inside of a Raspberry Pi. And it's actually TVM blue bar here. Lower is better because we're measuring inference time in milliseconds. Uh, does very well compared to the competing uh, runtimes and interpreters. Uh, and uh, this uh, performance is thanks to TVM's ability to perform all these custom optimizations, right? To generate code automatically for these different workloads on the target hardware in a very custom and bespoke way. And remember the example that I showed you from TensorFlow, uh, this is an operator that is being used uh, for uh, inference uh, inside of TensorFlow Lite, uh, sorry, inside of TensorFlow, yes, uh, in, inside of TensorFlow Lite. And um, the, as I told you, the, the implementation was 13 lines of code, whereas in TVM, it's about 700 lines long. And it covers a lot of different kernel sizes and data type implementations. So it's more compact, uh, it's more general, and it actually performs uh, better overall, as I showed with the results. So it's really a great solution for trying to tackle this problem of accelerating ML across a lot of different hardware targets across a lot of different models. And this is the technology that we're using um, to, to achieve this mission uh, at the company I work at. And so just to show you what kind of great applications you can have at a TVM, I'm just gonna talk about microcontroller support, which we call micro TVM very briefly. Uh, some of you might be interested in this idea of running uh, ML on tiny IoT devices that are extremely constrained. So how would one do that? And unfortunately in microcontroller land, we're dealing with extremely constrained devices. Um, typically they won't have an OS or a fully fledged OS. So a lot of the conveniences of modern OSs don't exist. There's very stringent memory constraints. Uh, and you know, those uh, those conveniences that you find in, in most of the computers we, we work with, right? Even Raspberry Pis or smartphones uh, don't exist. So you don't get virtual memory. You don't get advanced programming languages. And you also have all sorts of restrictions. So it's really the most extreme uh, deployment uh, that one can get here um, at the end of the day for ML. You know, this is the most extreme deployment example that one can face. And so, uh, Micro TVM was introduced to solve these challenges because essentially, foundationally, TVM as a code generator, as a compiler for ML, is a very powerful tool to have a very simple solution uh, to, uh, you know, to produce essentially a very bare bones artifact to get your ML running on microcontrollers, and it relies on our flexible code generation that can leverage GCC or LLVM or, enter, or any vendor specific uh, tool chain. We can target a lot of different ISAs and also a lot of different RTOSs. And to go back to the example of my colleague, uh, Murdad Hassar, uh, who's a UW researcher, trying to run his model on the uh, Microsoft uh, Azure Sphere, he had to face all these challenges. And so he leveraged TVM to get his model running on this device within a short amount of time, rather than having to build everything from the ground up. And so we took this keyword spotting model and got it to run on the different uh, hardware subsystems of the Azure Sphere. And uh, in this demo, he essentially shows 
you know, keyword spotting running in real time on, on the Azure sphere. And so you have to believe me that uh, these LEDs are in, indeed doing the right classification here. <laughs> but this was pretty neat, and, and this was put together in uh, you know just a, just a few weeks, uh, which was which was very impressive. And perhaps you might ask yourself, well, what about hardware accelerators, right? I, I, I provide a motivation. I talked about well portability, talked about efficiency, and also I talked about software stacks. And so some of you might be very interested in. Uh, hardware outside of your typical microcontroller or CPU or GPU, right? We want we want to deal with all these uh, fancy accelerators out there that will give us really great efficiency gains at the end of the day. And so the good news is that there are uh, actual commercial grade accelerators, and and uh, as Mohammed mentioned, that my my PhD uh, work was on this uh, VTA accelerator that was open source which actually paved the way for a lot of uh, hardware companies to, to build the compilers on top of TVM. But I'm happy to report after you know, all this time that we are seeing commercial uh, grade accelerators and, and MPYPs being supported by TVM, including ARM's Ethos U55 micro NPU. You can see that they're essentially taking models from you know, TF Lite, Onyx, PyTorch, and through the TVM front end, really graph optimizations and a whole lot of really uh, graph partitioning uh, transformations to your relay graph, you can essentially identify regions that you can offload to your accelerator and do all the compilation down thanks to T and TR optimizations, which I mentioned, right? Which are your low level operator specifications of each operator. You can essentially get something that will run on this macro NPU. So this example, and, and actually I, I put a tutorial link where you can actually try taking a, a model and through a simulator run the model on the Ethos U55 micro NPU. And keep in mind this is an NPU that 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 it lives on this tiny little microcontroller. So it leads to a lot of really exciting IoT applications. So there's a lot of color, the topics that I did not cover here, but there's, you know, it would take a whole lecture, a whole semester to go over all of these. I just wanted to talk briefly about what I do day to day. Uh, I work at OctaML, and the idea is to take all of that goodness that TVM introduces, all of that automation that TVM provides and optimization benefits, and essentially help guide the ML engineers to answer those questions of what is the best platform I can run my model on? Uh, how do they compare in terms of performance and cost? How can I optimize my models for a given hardware target as much as I can? And how can I get it into a really simple package to deploy it on as many systems as I can as seamlessly as possible? And so we've built this OctaML platform that combines a lot of different technologies to really simplify that story. And at the core, we really have TVM as a facilitator for this work. And so I just want to say that as a, as a researcher, it's really, it's really fun and exciting to take the work that you did during your PhD and, and take it to production and, and, and use it to solve real, real challenges and pains. And, and, um, and, and, and TVM has been a, a great technology to, to explore those challenges uh, with. And I just wanted to say as a, as a last note that we're hiring and we're growing. OctaML started in July of 2019, which seems like yesterday. Uh, and we've raised uh, over $130 million in, in venture capital. So we're growing very fast and we're at 120 people and continuing to grow. So. I've, I've, I've put a, a, a link to our careers page, but of course, feel free to shoot me an email uh, if you're interested. And, and of course, we're also looking for interns. So lots of uh, opportunities there. And at the end of this package, I've provided some links. You can look at resources, papers, or even tutorials. So I leave it at that. And, and hopefully we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, but I hope this was uh, interesting and you learned something today. And hopefully you'll be able to take a lot of this content and. I feel inspired to maybe apply TVM to some of your class projects. <laughs>